Chapter 1 This story started out so innocently. Perhaps it was not as innocent as it sounded. There had been thousands of scientists who had warned the humans of Earth that microorganisms that we have no protection from could be brought back from space. It doesn't matter what country brought this back, or who didn't take the proper precautions, the reality was that it was here and over one billion deadly organisms could fit on a dime. All mammals on Earth could not smell see or taste them until it was too late. The first sign that there was something dangerous entering our atmosphere was discovered at one of the, the many space stations that were scattered around the Earth. Without warning it was discovered that something was causing the outside of the station to be compromised. Something had quickly eaten a tremendous hold in one of the airtight chambers. There were safety protections taken immediately and it appeared that they had worked. For 40-8 hours there were no signs of this organism being anywhere and the people on the space station had started to breathe a little easier. But, on the third day the alarm went off once again and the station knew that the problem had just been stalled not stopped. So a very thorough sterilization was done, this time to the point that everyone at the station had to be separated even though they were now in full protective clothing. Every single day the station was completely cleaned and sterilized but day 5 was to be the beginning of the trouble on board. Everything was appearing to be normal when one of the men complained of a sore throat. This was not abnormal, as people do pick up ordinary sicknesses but because of the status of the space station he was separated even further and placed in a room where the air was completely purified. As per the rule of the outer space station, the science officer more affection ally known as Jim took his blood and handed it to his assistant. If I become very sick please find out what caused it and make sure it never reaches the people of Earth. With that he walked into the room where he could not get hurt, nor could he hurt anyone either. He walked in with his shoulders high and everyone prayed that he would be alright. Unfortunately, his condition worsened alarmingly and very quickly. Within less than 30 minutes he was acting like a pacing dog and very aggressive. As one of the men attempted to give him a glass of water he threw it on the floor. Contact with the ground was immediately made from the station and the people below started making plans. They had always known that there were dangers in space and they were. Dr. Olson was watching in the man on the monitor and found that the former science officer was showing signs of a disease that she knew all too well. As a young doctor she had worked in the poorer parts of India where there are many stray animals. The man could not have been exposed to such a disease, not there on a space station she thought. But, there were signs that he was suffering the affects of rabies. There were no animals on the space station, could it be the organisms that they had reported? She hoped not. But within the hour the sickness had gone from bad to worse very quickly. There was no longer any kind of contact with their friend Jim, the science officer. He just laid on the floor and moaned. He kept gasping and touching his throat. It was when he started to foam at his mouth that they became the most worrying thing. Mercifully, within the next hour Jim passed away. No one was to be allowed in the room at all. They could not enter because of the unknown sickness and the danger that he represented. With all the safety that could be mustered his body was cleaned and with the opening of a chute his body was destroyed and blown into outer space. The medial team had been very busy working on the blood that Jim had given them. Time and time again they tried different types, what caused this? But, the tests showed something that made no sense. All the indications were of someone who had developed rabies. Rabies was a deadly disease, but could take weeks for it to show up. There were thousands of cases in the world every year. And they had never heard of someone dying of it within three hours. Or had come from the land of Jan. They had been on their own land for millions of years and had finally become sophisticated enough to go into outer space. He and his people had known the dangers of outer space, but even in his most darkest part of his mind could he have expected what he had seen. He had been some many millions of miles away when his equipment had found signs of life not far ahead. He had taken his ship to this new place. The place was so large that he couldn't see anything but this place. It took up all of his line of view. But, the food was good. It was delicious and his men were getting stronger by the day. They had been running out of food and some of his men had died because of it. He tried all known avenues that he had to contact anyone who was in the building. He knew that there were life forms there, because his equipment told him so. But, without warning all of a sudden a huge storm came down on his people. 
It killed so many and injured so many. Why would they do such a thing? Kay had been his most trusted negotiator. She was smart beautiful and had never had an unkind thing to say about anyone or anything. With much effort and danger, she had managed to get into the large building. She had met a creature of gigantic size and tried to communicate with her. She had been swallowed up without warning. From the inside of this gigantic enemy she had called to him. She tried in vain to leave, but the enemy kept attacking her. They sent these white things that were fast and deadly, as she tried to find a place to find she had come across a loud never stopping beating machine along with two large items that seemed to be sucking in air. She shot at the beating thing and took her torpedoes out on the things that brought in air. They were too strong and as she found herself flying around in a large mass of grey the beating had stopped and she had died. Or made up his mind then and there that he would avenge the death of his friends partners and K no matter what. He sat down and began to make his plans. Chapter 2, Chapter 2 Dr. Olson had been reading the data that was coming through on the man who had once been a healthy human being. He had gone from a man with a slight sore throat to dead in less than three hours. His blood work was amazing. It was as though he had been attacked from the inside out. The thought and worry now was that they still had eight men and women on a ship in outer space that could not leave until this organism could be identified and eliminated. This had to be handled very carefully and with the utmost of discretion. This would be labeled Top Secret Class 1 International, the highest rating that the program was allowed to have. Meanwhile on board the space station things were very busy. Each and every piece that had been touched by their comrade Jim was going to have to be cleansed and cleansed once again. There would have to be a burning of everything that was not essential and his family was now going to have to be notified. Colonel Carson looked at his friend's few belongings and cringed as he went to put them into the incinerator. It was a difficult task, after all, just a short while ago he had destroyed his friend's earthly body. As the crew prepared to say a short goodbye to their friend they were worried. Every one of them had been aware of the dangers of living off of the planet up in the atmosphere, but an invisible enemy was not something that most of them had thought about. Jim had never known what had hit him. He just had a scratchy throat and within a few short hours he had died. Something had made contact with them just a few days ago. Had been the threat of something making its way into the station itself. It had, but what was it? Was it a virus of some sort? How could one fight something that couldn't be seen? This was going to be something that would need to be handled by the medical staff here on the station and back at the home base on Earth. Dr. Olson was the head of the medical staff both on Earth and at any space station that is involved with several different countries on the Earth. Her staff was very dedicated and they would work day and night to find out what this danger is or was sitting in the captain's chair thinking of the beings that had without mercy attacked his ships they had approached the house that they had found with peaceful intentions. They were a peaceful group who had left their home hoping to find new lives and enhance their own. S.A. his first in command approached him or, we need to try to contact these beings once again. We are here to find new lives and friends. Perhaps because of their tremendous size they didn't realize that what they were doing would harm us. This thought had crossed Orr's mind. The beings that they had contacted were tremendous. They stood over 80 parsecs tall and weighed over 500 ls. Orr had never heard of creatures that were that large. With just the swift movement of a hand they could wipe out his entire crew. I must realize that it is a definite possibility that these creatures have no idea of the damage that they have done. So, with those thoughts Orr tried once more to send a message to the beings that resided in the large structure. Since they were so small and they were so large perhaps something different would have to be sent but they were so large and he was so small. He estimated that all if he took all his ships and put them against the wall of the station alone one million of them could fit in the window alone. Perhaps more. Once again the choice was to be Orr's choice. He was in charge of the ships and their safety was of the highest priority to him. It was then that he made the decision to just leave this space debris and go on to another location. But, that was not an option, there was some kind of powerful field around the station and whenever his ship went just 20 parsecs past the station it was dragged back to its original location. It was then that the decision was made that he would send another ship into the building. There he was hoping that they would be able to reach out to the beings in their ship. Then without warning the storm once again was put up against Orr and his men. 
This time the storm was even longer and a great fireball came within a few short millies from his ship. Any more of this and his men would not survive. The storm made his men sick and made him feel sick himself. Even with the best filters that his men could make something was making his men sick and it was coming from the station that they were now stuck on. Everything had gone as well as could be expected. The station had once more been sanitized and each one of them were being kept as far apart from each other as possible. He went to the lab to see if there had been any discoveries on what might have killed his crewmen. There was little to work with they needed more material to work with. Unfortunately, for them the evidence had been destroyed with the hope of destroying whatever had invaded their space and caused Jim's death. Until there could be some kind of answer found by the people in his lab anyone and everyone on the station was in danger. Also, they would never be allowed to go home and see their family again either. This was going to be a major issue among the men and women who were calling the space station their temporary home. There was no one on the station that did not miss their homes and families. They must find an answer. There were two other space stations in the Earth's atmosphere and they too had been put on total lockdown. No organism had been found as of yet, but Colonel Carson knew how fast this could attack and the danger was very real. He had a dead friend to prove how dangerous things could be. Can this work? Is this another life? Oh what a thought. This is not a life as we know it. We would think of them as germs. The Colonel thought to himself. The thought of an organism having intelligence had never occurred to the people of Earth. This was going to be their downfall. Ego and narrow thinking had ruled the space program since its beginning. The universe is a large entity and lives and breathes as humans do here on Earth. Chapter 3 The time to do something about the situation was now. There was an enemy in the place that he could not escape from. The enemy was deadly and quick. They struck without warning again. This time everyone on board his ship had become ill. The ships would all come together and enter into the world within at once. Perhaps in force they would stand a better chance of being able to communicate with these deadly beings. They would use the same entry as their friend Kay had and would once more attempt to communicate. Or was there with the thoughts of a peaceful mission? He found these creatures interesting intelligent and when they weren't being aggressive towards him or his crew peaceful. He had been observing them from the captain's chair. Why did they not answer his many requests for some sort of communication? They had a communicator that was based totally on math and was considered a universal communicator. But, the people on the ship had made no response. Because the area that Orr and his crew were going to be going into was so vast they were to concentrate on the carbon-based beings who were on the ship. They were large and moved quickly, but a face-to-face -face communication was becoming the only way for them to be able to communicate their plight and find out what their thoughts are. He would not want to attack an unarmed crew without first finding out what their purpose was. That was the law of his land. They had always lived in peace and he was not willing to change that without at least attempting to speak to them one more time. Colonel Carson had been in the lab with the samples of Jim's blood when the alarm had once more sounded. Immediately he headed back to the main room of the ship and began to scan along with his science officer the perimeter. Once again there was no indication that anything was amiss, but everyone on board the ship knew otherwise. Down at the Space Center on Earth Dr. Olson had once more been notified that the alarm was going off at the space station. She immediately reached over to communicate with Colonel Carson directly. We still have not been able to identify the specific organism that caused your friend's death. It appears that it attacked all his vital organs from the inside. There were no outer marks and you said that it began with a sore throat. It indicates to me that he might have swallowed something or inhaled it. Please be careful she warned. O.T. and his group of ships entered through a very narrow slot between what appeared to be some kind of expulsion chamber. The trip was long and tedious, but within five hours all of his ships had made it safely through the tiny hole. They now found themselves in a vast strange room. The room went on for millies and millies but he was determined to find the communication center. Finally after spending many hours he was able to find one of the beings next to a screen. This screen appeared to be speaking to the being. This was it. This was the communication center. But, the noise, how did these people work? Were they deaf? 
There was a loud ringing that never stopped in that room. He watched as one of the giants walked over to the console that they were communicating with. His mouth was moving and the thunder that his voice caused was deafening. He was speaking to others, why did he not communicate him? But, then without warning one of his ships got too close to one of the beings and they were being dragged into the body. He had seen that happen with Kay the brave diplomat who so heroically had given her life just days before. Immediately ships were headed over to help the ship, but it was too late they were inside the being. Maya had been at the helm when she had been caught up in an extremely strong suction. She was thinking that it might have simply been a breath from the being. With all thrusters at full the force had been too strong and fast for her to do anything. She and her crew were now inside one of these giants. Now was not the time to panic. If there was a way in there had to be a way out. That was logical and she would set upon attempting to find a way out of this being. The crew had thought that the ringing inside of the room had been deafening the noise inside the body was one thousand times worse. Then there was the problem that because of the deafening sound within the body of this being they could not communicate with any other ships in the area. No one had been hurt, but they needed to find a way out of this. They had found themselves in a river that was flowing in a pulsing motion. As a matter of fact the river was flowing and pulsing to the sound of the huge organ that seemed to be controlling the body that that they had entered. It was some sort of pump and she felt that the best course at that moment would be not to fight it. Two of Maya's most trusted men wanted to leave in their shuttle and investigate the beating pump that seemed to control much of this being's life. She had reluctantly allowed the men to leave as they would be back in less than 30 minutes. As the two men got closer and closer to the beating pump they could see that it had several valves attached and it appeared that the rivers went right through it. Joe had just reached over to take a small sample when there was a huge shaking and nose that threw him hard against the pump. As he tried to communicate back with Maya and the ship he found that he no longer had any communication with them. Carrie had been over at the communication center when she had cleared her throat. The noise alarmed Colonel Carson as that had been what had happened to Jim. He knew that death had come so quickly. Are you all right? He asked her. I just have a tickle in my throat Carrie told him. Now, she knew that she must go to the sanitation room as had Jim. She didn't want to because she was frightened. She had seen what had happened to Jim and the thought of it happening to her was terribly frightening. But, Dr. Olson wanted a few more samples from any other sick people this time. Carrie took a saliva sample and a skin sample and left it for the lab to look at. Perhaps even if it didn't help her it might help someone else. As she walked into the room to live the last few minutes of her life she felt a tear come down her face. With this tear without warning Maya and her crew had found themselves on the outside of the body once again. She checked her crew and other than the two men that she had allowed to leave in their shuttle everyone was safe and accounted for. Chapter 4, Chapter 4 Joe now found himself caught in a body with a very small vessel with not even half of the power of the big ships. There was no food either and they were getting hungry. This being was so large that the two men decided that they could take small slits from certain areas and consume them. The first thing they tasted was the sample that they had taken from the pump. It was delicious and the decision was made to take some more. They were so small they used the logic that this being would just heal itself and not even miss the small samples that they had taken. Carrie was now aware that she was sick. She felt a pain as if someone was sticking a pin into her heart and she had sneezed so hard that it had actually hurt. Now along with the sore throat and the pain in her heart she was beginning to get the chills. She was hot but she was shaking as if she was cold. She reached for a blanket and took a seat in the chair. The people in the station were now worried once again. They could see that their friend was sick and showing the same symptoms that their friend Jim had. She was hot and sweating but shaking and wrapped in a blanket. Carrie is there anything we can do for you? They asked their friend. She just shook her head her throat hurt too bad to talk anyways. She decided to write to her family and showed what she wanted to say by lifting the board up so that all her friends could see it. To my family I love you and wish you all well. Do not grieve for me. I am doing what I always wanted to do. Everything will be alright and we will be back together someday. I love you. As Anne copied down what her friend had written she had to turn her head. She could feel a tear starting to come down her cheek and did not want her friend to see it. 
Joe and his mate R.A. were having more problems in their tiny ship. They were running low on fuel and would soon be at the mercy of this body. It was so large and so strong, they just didn't have any way to escape from it. They were basically in a flood and being dragged all over this being's body. They tried to latch on to some things as they had been pumped all over, but the force of the fluid had made it impossible. Unless they found a way to escape they were doomed. Finally the flow of the liquid seemed to be slowing down and the men in the small capsule had a chance to look around. This was a functioning body and there had to be an escape, they would be patient. But, then they arrived in a very grayish area and as they bumped along they could see the damage their small ship was doing. They were killing the being. That was not what they had intended. They had wanted to communicate with it not kill it. They were doing to it as it had done to them. This was not going to work. Or had seen enough and started to prepare to enter the body of the person in the room. She had been separated from the rest and had been lying there. He was sure that she was suffering, as his people had. Why did they insist on killing his people? This was not a good thing. Both sides were now suffering. Once again he headed over to the communications officer and tried to communicate with her. But, as or got to her he found himself being sucked into her body just like the others. With all thrusters and quick action he managed to pull away at the last moment. This being was very dangerous. How could he communicate? If he got too close he would surely be killed and yet if they didn't communicate with him they were certainly die also. Larry was at the lab working when he got the tickle. It wasn't much, but it was as though he might be coming down with a cold. He knew that this was not good and that he needed to tell his supervisors. But, they were busy in the other room and he felt alright still so he continued working. He took a sample of his skin his saliva and three vials of his blood and placed them in the refrigerator. What he didn't realize is that on the sample was one alien. It was just one being but they could multiply in just moments. Feeling good did not last long, though, for Larry. Within ten minutes he started to get the chills and had to notify everyone on the station that he too was sick. I have taken my blood saliva and skin for samples. Please try to find out what this horrible disease is he told them. As the body of Corey was cremated and sent out into space or and his crew found themselves being thrown away from the station and its confines. His ship was hurtling towards a planet at an alarming speed. The emergency had taken on a reality both on Earth and on the station now. It was not good three of the nine crew members were now sick and dying. Two were already dead and unless a miracle happened Larry was going to be next. Larry had been the head lab technician and now the investigation into what kind of virus this was was going to have to be done mostly on Earth. As the body of Carrie had been cremated and sent into outer space or had found his ship in an uncontrollable spin. The ship was now free from the confines of the building, but the gravity of the planet below was far too powerful and him and his ship and crew were headed towards the planet at an alarming speed. Try as he could or could not stop his ship. He did his best to land safely and with the death of many of his men he had survived along with a few of his crew. They were here on a planet. Perhaps now he and his crew would find a less aggressive population. But, or and his crew had landed on Earth. The one thing you can say about Earthlings is that we are never calm never quiet and always aggressive. If he had wanted peace he had landed on the wrong planet. Chapter 5, Chapter 5 Everyone who had been under Orr's command had known the dangers of going out into space. They were all dedicated to the cause of finding new life and had taken the oath of honesty ad non-aggressiveness that her planet had demanded. But, they had just seen their commander shot through a hole and he roof of this tremendous building and had not heard anything from him since. They had seen their friends and co-crew members killed or injured by these beings and there had never been one attempt to reply to any of their attempts at communication. The ship that Orr had been commanding had just blown out of a hole where the beings had sent the body of the person who had died through. The motion had been fast and come without warning. And Orr and his crew had gone out of the range of their communicators within seconds. Now it was Eve's command. She had been third in command but the second in command had disappeared along with Orr and his ship. She was a strong logical person who would continue the team's quest to communicate with the beings at the station. The alternative was not in the best interest of either party. Whenever the two of them came in contact death had been sure to follow on both sides. It was illogical to think that these beings would want to die any more than her crew did. 
Eve thought of the board that the woman had written on to her friends on the station of some sort. She had used a block to say something and the other beings had responded by writing back. Where was that tablet? It was huge, but the beings were so large perhaps they couldn't hear her or them because of their size. It would be a difficult thing to accomplish, but it was their only hope that she could come up with and she felt that they needed to work fast. Or was now on Earth and was trying to get his bearings. Much of the equipment on his ship had been badly damaged and he couldn't seem to get any bearings on his location. They were working on the communications board and thought that it would be up in about two hours. As he looked through his viewfinder he saw that this must be the land where the beings from the building had come from. In the far distance or could see a house that could easily house over a million of his friends. It would easily hold ten thousand ships, even ships as big as the one he had. He decided to take his crippled ship and try to hit it over there in a tree. They were small and perhaps he could repair his ship without being exposed to too much danger. Unfortunately for Orr and the people of Earth the choice had not been a good one. It was not a safe place. They found themselves in a hole where another creature lived. This creature was gigantic and had a huge tail that was capable of knocking the ship all around. He seemed unaware of the ship and seemed to be very busy moving some strange shaped items around with his feet. The noise was deafening and they were being thrown around once more like a rag doll. Or found that his ship would no longer move on its own as the damage to the outside had been tremendous and his crew was now in danger once again. With much trepidation Or and his friend and crew member Lo made their way to the doorway that his ship had that would allow him to enter this strange new world. The atmosphere had tested as an atmosphere that was compatible with what he would need to survive so with a hint of caution Lo and Or stepped off the ship. Or had not meant to get caught in the creature's fur, but he had gotten stuck and no matter what he did he couldn't get away. He pulled out his phaser and with the best of accuracy cut the hair that had entangled him. The creature had responded by brushing the spot knocking Or nearly off of him. In the confusion he scratched the creature. Chapter 6 Gary was already getting hot and then cold. There was no explaining it. He felt terrible and the spot where the squirrel had bitten him was red and swollen by now. Susie stepped on the gas, she couldn't believe how sick Gary was getting and it hadn't been any longer than 20 minutes or so since he had been bitten she was sure. As Susie pulled the car up to the emergency room she grabbed Gary, who now could not walk and carried him running into the emergency room. Please someone help me quick. My son is very sick. He got bit by a squirrel and he can't even walk anymore. A nurse came right over to Susie and Gary and carried him into a triage room. There she found that his temperature was 101 degrees and that his pulse was racing so fast that she could barely count it. His blood pressure was alarmingly low also. She had never seen anything like this and certainly nothing like this had ever happened from a squirrel bite that she had heard of. Quickly in four was inserted and a doctor came into the room to check the little boy out. He had his blood drawn and ordered his heart to be monitored. Gary was now just moaning and barely conscious. Do you know what happened to the squirrel? The doctor asked. Susie thought for a moment. I know where the squirrel has his nest. Perhaps the squirrel went back there. The doctor immediately got on the phone and called the board of health. He needed the squirrel to find out just what had made that squirrel so sock. That was probably the same thing that was making the little boy sick. He would need to run some tests on the squirrel if he was to have a chance to save the little boy's life. Bob had left work and gone to the hospital as fast he could. When he arrived at the emergency room and identified himself he was immediately met by the doctor. Your son is very sick and we need to know more about the squirrel that attacked him. The Board of Health and Animal Control is on their way to your house. It would save an immense amount of time if you could take us to the tree where the squirrel made his home. We are doing all we can to help Gary, but now we need your help. Bob wanted to stay with his son but he knew how important it was to find that squirrel. He said I will be on my way. Can I just have a moment with my son? He asked. The doctor understood and knew that this might be the last time that the boy or his dad would ever see each other again alive shook his head yes. As Bob walked into the room where his once energetic happy little boy was lying he was shocked beyond words. Susie was sitting next to him in complete shock while Gary had an oxygen mask and for a heart monitor on and was now in a coma. 
Susie and Bob hugged each other and he told her what he was going to do. As he ran out of the room he called their priest. Animal control arrived at the small farm and began to look for signs of a sick animal. But, even though it was a small farm it had five acres to cover. They were relieved to hear that the little boy's father was on his way to the farm. He knew of the squirrel that his little boy had considered a friend and he knew where the squirrel lived. John Klein had just stepped out of his car when he saw another car coming into the driveway. It was Bob and he was here to show them the squirrel's home. The two men shook hands and Bob took him right to the squirrel's home. As they turned on the flashlight to look into the nest they could see the squirrel. It was obvious that the poor animal was dead. He had dried blood coming out of everywhere his eyes his ears his mouth. It was obvious that this animal had suffered a horrific death. There was evidence that the squirrel had had some kind of seizure as the nuts were strewn all around. With great care the man from the Board of Health and Animal Control took the dead animal very carefully and wrapped it up in plastic. Every piece was to be taken from the nest. Unfortunately for the men on Orr's ship this meant that they were being taken also. Now they would be separated from Orr and Lo and perhaps they would never see each other again. But from the people of Earth's view this would spell the beginning of a pandemic, a pandemic that have never been imagined before. For they were sending out an organism that could destroy each and every carbon form on the planet. Now that the squirrel's remains had been removed Bob once again hurried to the hospital to check on his son. But, what he found was his worst nightmare. No matter what the people did in the emergency room Gary was not getting better. As a matter of fact he was getting much worse and was going to have to be put on a ventilator soon. A pediatrician from Boston had been consulted tests after test had been done on the little boy suggestion after suggestion had been given and nothing was working. No matter what Dr. Harris and every other doctor in the hospital did there was no denying it the little boy was dying and they were helpless. Jennifer had just gotten out of work at the emergency room that afternoon. It had been a long and hard one and that poor little boy, he got equals was so sick. All from the bite of a squirrel, how sad. But. As she began to make supper for her kids she got what she would call a tickle in her throat. But, when she tried to clear it she knew that her throat was sore also. She would gargle and stay away from the food. She was sure it was nothing to worry about. As her daughters came into the house they saw that their mother looked as if she didn't feel good. Let me do that why don't you take a seat mom? You don't look good Maureen told her mother. I have a little sore throat that's all. Jennifer told her. But within the hour Maureen had to call 911. Her mother was now having trouble breathing. Chapter 7, Chapter 7 The doctors did all they could for the little boy, but just three hours after being admitted into the hospital the little boy had begun to bleed from his eyes his nose anything that had a hole in it apparently. There was nothing anyone could do to help this poor boy. As the ambulance pulled into the hospital with Jennifer in it the staff recognized her immediately. She was the triage nurse at the emergency room. Just a few short hours ago she had been a vibrant hard-working woman and now she had a temperature of 103 and rising a barely readable pulse and appeared to becoming delusional. This needed to be reported to the Board of Health immediately. This time cautions were taken and no one had any contact and protective gear was now being used. No one was sure what was wrong with this lady and just like the little boy Gary she was going downhill fast. On the space station the alarm was now sounding again and everyone was now in total fear. They were thousands of miles from any help and even if they could be reached it wasn't safe for anyone to come near them. The last thing anyone on the station wanted to do was expose the earth to the disease that was killing them. It came on so fast and death was so quick, it was very frightening. Three people had no passed on from the disease and there were only six of them left. Kyle Green had worked for the animal control for over 10 years. He had a master's in biology and began to inspect the remains of the squirrel who had attacked the little boy. The squirrel was a male of about 8 months old. He showed no signs of being ill before whatever had killed him. He was of a good weight and had been well known to the family. Gary, the little boy had been feeding him since he was a baby. It saddened him to realize that the little boy had died from whatever had killed this squirrel. He knew that he must find an answer before someone else got sick. From the position that they had found the squirrel and he knew that the squirrel had made it home and tried to get comfort in his nest. He had died horribly bleeding from both the internal organs and the outer organs. 
With a magnifying glass he went over each and every section of the animal's body. He was specifically looking for a scratch or bite that might have been caused by another animal. With extreme caution each piece of the body was examined. It was after hours of looking that Kyle found a very small spot on the squirrel's back that had what appeared to be some kind of singe around it. The spot was less than one sixty-fourth of an inch long but it was there. He carefully removed the skin and hair from around the wound and went over to the microscope. Aaron his lab assistant came over to help him with his findings. The two of them examined the skin and hair very carefully. Yes, there were signs that something might have become tangled in the squirrel's fur. But, it was as though some kind of heat was used to cut the hair. Both Aaron and Kyle found themselves at a loss as to what could have caused such damage. The damage was minimal and should have healed quickly. Instead there was a chance that this small scratch had been the cause of the squirrel's death. They would continue looking toward other answers, but placed the information in their reports. Dr. Olson had been working day and night on the problem at the space station. There were three dead people up there and she had no answer as to what had happened or why. She didn't know what was attacking them and she wanted to have an answer. Now, she had been informed that once again the alarm at the space station was ringing and knew that everyone was in imminent danger once again. Eve had found that commanding such a large group of ships and their crews was more time-consuming than she had thought. Or had done it so smoothly and easily. But, now he was gone. The explosion that had sent her commanding officer out into space had been so loud and forceful that three of her ships had been destroyed. Along with those three ships she had lost 200 more crew members. By the tremendous thunder-like sounds that Eve and the other crew members could hear coming from outside their ship they could tell that the beings in the building were moving around quickly. Once again she could hear the sound of an alarm. The beings were being warned that something was happening she thought to herself. Could she find the alarm system and communicate with the crew of that building? Max was her best engineer. She called to him. Max, I need to know where that ringing sound is coming from. I believe it is an alarm. It could be some alarm system that is allowing the beings to know that something has entered their environment. If we could somehow change the sound or use it for communication, we could conceivably save our people and theirs. We know now that when we enter their bodies, against our will, they die. We can't leave because of the gravity that they have around the station and mean them no harm. There was no need to tell Max or anyone else on this ship and the others of the dangers that the beings in the room represented to them. Each and every one of them had lost a friend or family member to these creatures. He replied I, I will get to work on that right away. Perhaps if we could just communicate with each other we could come up with some kind of understanding and with that Max went to his office to see what he could do. Or had been not too far from his ship when he got the message from his men. They had been picked up and were on their way to we don't know where. Some beings that appeared to be of the same race as the people in the building came to the nest where we were staying and took everything out of it. Or put on his tracker and watched as his ship was heading in a northeast direction at a speed of about 60 miles per hour. He would arrive there shortly himself and see what he could do to help his shipmates. But things at the hospital, a quiet country hospital, were going downhill so fast that the doctors could no longer even see all the patients. Mark Dunn had been on his way home when he had gotten the call. He was an emergency room nurse and he was needed back at the ER immediately. As Mark pulled up he couldn't believe his eyes. There were people in obvious distress standing in line to see a doctor outside. In a hospital that usually saw 50 to 60 patients a day there were over 500 in line waiting to see a doctor. Just by looking at some of them he could tell that they were dying. What could possibly be wrong? Chapter 8, Chapter 8 Eve had ordered not one of her ships to come within a 20-foot safety zone. She now wanted to make sure that the beings and her were safe from each other. It was difficult as the beings kept on walking around but they had managed to stay away from the strange beings so far. Max had finally found a possible way to communicate with the beings that inhabited that building in space. But, it was hard for him to figure it out and the buttons that controlled it were so large. Fifty of the ships would be required to even be able to press down on one of the buttons for a moment. The best thing that he could do was to send three short beeps. To his luck, though Max was able to find the repeat button. He could have his ships send the notes and the other ships hit the repeat. 
They could do this possibly three times every ten minutes. Yes that would work. As Max explained what could be done to Eve the plan was put in place. They would use fifty ships each volunteering on each button and try communicate in that manner for the next hour. It was going to take a lot of fuel, but they needed to reach these beings somehow. Colonel Carson had been at the lab when his communication officer contacted him. Colonel Carson, I am receiving a strange pattern. It is three beats and it repeats itself three times. The colonel jumped up and said, Can you find the source of this communication? This was going to be a surprise to him and all her members of their space crew. The reply from communication was it is coming from within our station. Ship had been under attack for several days now. The alarm had been ringing for what seemed hours and now something inside of the ship was making contact with them? He replied quickly I am on my way there. Eve thought that they might get an answer so she was standing at her communication center when there it was. There was the reply of the three beeps repeating themselves three times. The beings had heard their communication. She immediately answered with three beeps so that there would be no confusion as to whether or not someone in their building was attempting to communicate with them. Colonel Carson had been involved in the space program for many years and had never had any kind of contact with a being that had not come from the Earth. But, there were those three beeps. Yes, someone was trying to communicate with them. Math Math had always been the universal language. He would attempt to send a signal using math as a language and see if they would respond. He immediately contacted the ground control and awaited their response. To Eve's amazement the response had been quick. Now she just didn't know how to communicate the fact that they were aware of the dangers that they had imposed on the gigantic creatures. She also wanted to make it clear that the rain that they had placed on their ships had killed many of them. She must let them know their location so that the beings in the room would stay away from her and her crew. Charles Nelson had been monitoring all the communication on board the space station. He had heard the same three beats that they had heard on the space station and actually had gasped when he had heard them respond to the three beats the crew on the spaceship had sent back to them. Professor Sam Jones was expert mathematician and had studied the ability to converse universally by using numbers instead of words. He had been at his study working when he gotten the call from the space center. His talent and knowledge was needed immediately. As he hung up the phone and prepared to leave for the space center he heard a knock on the door. It was a government agent and he had been sent to bring him personally to the space center. He then knew how important it was for him to come. Or had been making his way as quickly as he could to the place where his crew were now staying. They had been unable to repair his ship as of yet and were virtual prisoners of the beings that had already shown them how dangerous they could be. Dot or was an adult man who knew that there could be cruelty anywhere, but he hoped that this near war was just a matter of a misunderstanding. The last thing that he wanted was to start a universal war. It was his duty to keep the peace and watch out for his crew and ship. He had come in peace and wanted to leave in peace if he could. But, meanwhile in the small town of Iris things were getting completely out of control. The Center for Disease Control had been notified and they were sending a specialist to the town. Everyone was getting sick or knew someone who had gotten sick. The hospital had no more rooms and now the doctors and nurses were either sick dying or dead themselves. It had gotten so bad that there was no one to take care of the patients anymore. Dr. Mark Grover had been working at the Center for Disease Control for years when he saw the message about what was happening in the small town in New Hampshire. A disease that had been unknown just two days ago had spread to nearly the whole community. Everyone in the town was dying dead or knew someone who was sick. The hospital had no one there to help them either. Now all of the doctors and nurses were either sick dying or dead also. It seemed that the first sign of the illness was a sore throat and death would occur within hours. The worst part is the deaths were horrible. The patients would bleed from all open parts of their bodies, sometimes while still conscious. Even the pain pills were doing nothing for these poor souls. The first child that had contacted the disease had been bitten by a squirrel. Every single squirrel that could be found in town had been tested and there were no other cases of any illness where they were concerned. It seemed as though the original squirrel was an isolated case. But how did the squirrel get so sick? Before his parents had died they both stated that their son had always fed that squirrel and that you could actually pet him. 
They had seen the squirrel the night before and said that he was acting totally normal and there was no indication of sickness at all. But as the doctors worked to find out what was going on there was a report of a possible case in England. Someone from the town in New Hampshire had gone for a visit to family and now everyone was sick there too. The disease was spreading and Dr. Grover needed to... Chapter 9. Professor Jones arrived at the place we know as NASA early that evening. He had been rushed so fast that he hadn't even brought a toothbrush or his shaving things. He was greeted by several men who were working very hard on a mathematical equation, this was something he had never seen before. Dr. Olson the head of the medical department and had been working around the clock on a solution to this disease. It was now totally out of control with nearly 1,000 deaths so far. It had spread so quickly and she found herself helpless to help the people of the world. There had not been one person to survive the sickness and it came upon people so fast that by the time they realized how sick they were they were either dead or dying. Now, the first reports were coming in from Asia. There was a case in Thailand and it was spreading quickly as it had done in the United States. Soon the entire world would be infected if she and her team did not find some kind of treatment or cure for this terrible disease or was in the prime of his life just 35 years old and in the best of condition, but something that these beings had exposed him to was making him ill. He had not felt well in days ever since the strange rain was aimed at his ship. He was sure it was some kind of medicine that these beings had aimed at his area. Did they know that they were harming his crew? Or did they not know that what they were doing was causing the death of many of his people? Every hour someone from Orr's crew died from the aftermath of that horrible rain. He listened to the same story over and over and knew that his medical team was having no luck in finding a solution. Their only hope was to contact the beings that inhabited the planet and try to come to some kind of truce. It could mean the end of both of their worlds as they knew it if they didn't do something and do it fast. Meanwhile the men who had been removed from the squirrel's home were finally no longer moving. As they opened their viewfinder once more they realized that they were in another building. Their skin told them that there were two beings in the room at the time. Things were not going well on board the ship that was now on Earth either. Many of the crew had either died or were too sick to work. Jay had been fourth in command and now found himself to be the first in command of the great ship. He was feeling all right and hoped that he would be able to find some kind of solution to the problem that he and his crew were facing. As Jay looked around the room in which they were now sitting he realized that it was a laboratory. It was huge but he recognized the microscope and many other pieces of equipment that were in the room. Jay was sure that because he and his crew were so small that the beings had not been able to see them or their ship. But there was the microscope could he somehow put some sort of message on the outside of his ship and place it under the microscope? Would that allow the beings to know that there is someone in the room with them that wishes to communicate with them? Yes, indeed it was worth a shot. He summoned everyone on the ship and together they took the dangerous job of going outside in the lab and started to paint the numbers 855. That was their distress call. Jay was almost certain that the being had a different distress call, but the numbers should get their attention. This was going to be a very dangerous undertaking and everything would have to be done with very careful precision. Or was still out of communication range, but his tracking was working well. He would be able to arrive at the location of his ship and crew within the next three hours. But, did they have that much time? What kind of danger were they now facing? They had not moved in quite a few minutes and or was beginning to be very concerned. Professor Jones had worked his entire life on different ways to communicate. Whatever was on board the space station was intelligent and wanted to communicate with the people that were there. He was sure that they too had suffered loss of life. The chemicals that had been poured onto the outside of the space station had been designed to kill beings of their type. He had never thought that something like a virus could be intelligent and think like he did. 
What an amazing chance this was going to be! The simple dot 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 that the creatures had sent to the crew at the space station had been proof of the intelligence that this disease or virus was carrying. There was no denying the fact that they too had a right to live. Perhaps something could be worked out and the people of Earth would make friends with the beings that they had once considered as something to kill and get rid of only. After calculating and rechecking his numbers over and over Professor Jones had come up with the numbers 855. When the numbers were put together quickly they had the sound of the dot 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 and perhaps this would allow the beings who had invaded the space station the understanding that what they were doing was causing harm to the people who were on the spaceship. Dr. Olson was in the lab working once again. She had been working for two days with little or no rest and thought to herself I need to check some more of these slides. They just came in and they were taken from the tree where the squirrel had made his nest. Jay looked up to see one of the large beings walking right towards his ship. The painting was just completed, but some of his crew were still outside of the ship. He made an emergency call and somehow everyone managed to get in before the being arrived at their little hiding area. The shaking of the ship was so strong that Jay was sure it was damaged beyond repair this time. As they were shaken and dropped like a rock, Jay looked around. Although, her crew was shaken up everyone was all right. Now where were they Jay wondered. To her delight she realized that they were under the microscope. As Dr. Olson took out a slide she blinked her eyes. What did she see? As she adjusted the microscope to get the clearest view she almost fell over. There in a very minute corner of her slide were the numbers 855. She was sure this was not something that had happened naturally this had been placed on a piece of equipment on purpose. Now to be very careful. As she did not want to harm anything that might be within this tiny very tiny piece of some sort of metal it looked like. Dr. Olson then walked over to her computer and with the smallest writing that the computer was capable of she typed the numbers 855. Jay smiled as she saw the numbers appear in her viewfinder. They were now known. They could work things out she hoped. Chapter 10, Chapter 10 Jay was so excited to find out that the beings in the lab had acknowledged her message. There was now hope that the two worlds could come together and become allies not enemies. What she and or and others among their group was that as they had been blown away from the space station they had landed on the planet, but another one of the ships had also been involved. Involved in the landing on the planet was another damaged ship called Kara. Kara was a different ship and belonged to a different group. This group was not part of the federation of which or belonged. They were considered rebels and were from another land. They multiplied quickly and tended to be very aggressive. Ho finally had been able to take a small break. His men and women had been very successful in becoming a part of the planet. These beings were weak and easily taken control of. With any luck his crewmen would gain control of most of the land within a few months. Once they had taken over the planet his people would finally have a place to call their own. It had been centuries since the people who honored and accepted Ho's way of life had had any peace in their lives. Or and his crew had always had the support of the people of their planet. They had been in the minority, poor undereducated and commonly called a lower class of people. After centuries of unfair treatment, he and his group had finally been successful in leaving their planet. Max was now faced with a new problem. He had been busy finding a way to reach the beings who had been attacking his men and women on the station. Meanwhile he had also been busy looking into the possibility that someone else had left the station the bad news for the people on the station and the planet possibly was that he had found a small sign that when they had entered the room where the beings were there had been another ship along with them. It had been as Max and his men had been doing their normal routine when they had been busy accounting for debris that had been accumulated in the room since they had entered through the small hole some hours before. It was there that they had discovered that there had been at least one additional ship on the space station at least for a short while. He knew who that other ship was probably. He hoped that he was wrong but he knew that he needed to speak with Eve. Professor Jones was now sending his message to the people on the station. He was now aware that there were not alone in their quest for the truth. There was a new strain that had hit the Middle Eastern part of the world. This strain was much more aggressive. This could be an entirely different entity from the beings that he was going to be communicating with. But, with communication there was hope that they could know the truth. 
Dr. Olson had picked up the phone and called over to the engineering department to let them know that she had come in contact with the beings who were now in their lab. She did not feel that she had the right to leave the room. Anyone in the room needed to be kept from anyone else in the area. General Blake had been going over and over the data when he was reached by Dr. Olson. The beings were here in their lab. How did that happen? They had sent the same message to them from the space station. This indicated to General Blake that there was a real possibility that the beings were the same here in the lab and there at the space station. Ho had discovered with delight that the creatures that inhabited the planet that he had landed intended to group together and the transfer of his men and women had been quick and easy. With each passing hour his crew had moved from being to being leaving the beings either sick or already dead. There were so many areas for his crew to escape from safely once they had been successful in getting the beings sick. Although the beings were very large they were very weak. It was easy to enter into their bodies and to go around to each of the pulsating parts and damage them. They provided much needed nutrients for his crew also. Sick finally, after months of being on board a ship with little or no food they had been able to eat and eat well. Before the being got sick it had been his policy for his crew to take slices of skin and bone for their meals once they had left the body. But, with so many beings they had just gone from one being to the next. It was almost a race to him and his crew to see how many beings they could infect in a few hours time. After hours of flying at the fastest speed that or could muster out of the small space shuttle he had finally arrived at the location of his crew and missing ship. Like the station the place was very well guarded, but it was not as tightly confined as the ship had been in the outer space and or had no problem getting access to the area. He was following the tracker system when he entered what was a very large lab. Jay had been contemplating what her next move was going to be when or finally made contact. Up until this time she had not been sure as to whether or not or had survived and was relieved to hear his voice over the radio. She welcomed her commanding officer back and with a breath of relief opened the doors to the ship to allow or back into the place where he belonged. As Or made his way down the corridor he was met by Jay. Or I have had some success in reaching the beings that inhabit this room. I gave them the numbers 855 and they responded by repeating the same numbers. There has been no more movements since, but the being has been talking on that large black object quite a bit and from what our translator has been able to translate has been talking to another being about what we sent out. The shaking of the ship has ceased also. The damage to the ship has been massive, but Max the engineer says that she will fly again. Or took his seat in the captain's chair once more. Through the viewfinder he took a look around the room once more. The room was huge and he could see the being who was talking into the large black box of some type. She was now leaning over the ship and smiling. She was a friendly being, or now had to figure a way to speak to her. He looked at the translator and made his first attempt at an actual speech. Because, the language was very different from the language of his people the translator had never come across a language such as this the conversation would be choppy at best. As or spoke into the translator he wished that emotion would have shown up, but the translator had been designed to show no emotion just the words. My name is or I am the commanding officer of this ship. He nodded and his communication officer sent the message. Now, everyone on board was waiting for the being to respond. Dr. Olson had been looking at the small metallic object that she had nearly missed. The metal object was so small that she estimated that over 1,000 of them would easily fit within a one-inch square, probably closer to a million. General Blake was in the communication center when he got the message. It was a little confusing but he got the name or an officer. The other words were not real words, but it was an intelligent communication and this time in English. It was time for him to call the president. As he picked up the phone he sent the message My name is General Blake and I am the leader of this space program. I do not wish to be your enemy we wish to be your friends. Chapter 11, Chapter 11 As the virus or disease spread from state to state the people had become frightened and confused. The deaths had swept through the country and the world in just a matter of weeks. Children were coming home to find their parents' bodies. They were in a horrible state and in most cases in the process of being eaten by bugs and sometimes even worse other animals. But, when it came to the animals they were getting sick then and spreading the disease among themselves. 
It wasn't known for sure if the animals were devouring the dead humans because they were just hungry or if the animals that were eating the humans were doing so because they too had the disease. There were so many stories of cannibalism being reported among the people of Thai horrible acts between themselves. Docile animals such as deer and rabbits were no longer gentle. You had to watch for any kind of animal and avoid or prepare to protect yourselves at all times. You could no longer trust friends co-workers neighbors or anyone. If they weren't raping eating murdering you they were robbing you or something even worse. There had been an emergency meeting at the United Nations, but there had been such danger that those who managed to escape could not get home anyways. No one was allowed to leave the country and if they managed to get out of the country they were shot when they tried to enter their own land. You were trapped in the house praying for your own safety. Soon there would be no place to hide unless a cure was found or at least some sort of vaccination. The Center for Disease Control in Atlanta was working hard to find out the cause of the disease and had been able to bring it down to a strain that had shown up one more time. The disease had been stopped before, but while still in outer space. It was found on the space shuttle calendar. Because of the power that the space program held they had been able to convince the people of the world that it had been a horrific accident. Little did the people know that they had almost been all killed by this virus before. The only victims of the virus that time had been the crew of the calendar. But the space program had done this some 40 years ago. Was there a chance that the virus had just stayed on Earth dormant for all these years and was now just making itself known? They were intelligent as the communications had proven. Was this a well-planned act of revenge upon the people of Earth? This frightened the people involved in the space program and politicians from around the world deeply, and with good reason. Their hope now laid in the interaction that the two groups the virus and the people of Earth was going to be communication and diplomacy. What we were doing to the beings was killing them also. It was time for them to sit down and have a talk with these beings that the people of Earth knew only as a virus. It was a meeting that would require the best and so a group of diplomats from the United Nations were selected. They represented seven countries and six continents. They all knew their lives and families' lives were at stake and this would be the negotiation that would either save or destroy the world. Dr. Olson along with many of her colleges felt that it was not safe to move the beings from the location that they had been sitting in. There was no possible way to move the slide that was still under the microscope without causing harm to the creatures who were in their vessel at the moment. If all of the beings from the other planet were in the vessel the chance of spreading the disease was much lower. Also there was a much lesser chance that something might happen to them accidentally. She could drop a glass or trip anything and it could cause great harm to such small beings. She would stay right where she was at least 8 feet away from the microscope. The United Nations team was flown by private jet into the space station complex and immediately taken into the small room that held the lab. They understood why it was necessary for them to go there instead of the virus bacteria or beings coming to them. The danger to the beings and the danger to the still remaining healthy population of the country could be compromised. As the team entered into the room they noticed that it was just a small regular lab with nothing special. They saw the microscope with the slide still underneath it and realized that on that small slide was the key to the saving of their planet. Or had been in the captain's chair awaiting for what he had understood was a group of specialists that would be arriving in the room there would be the translator along with the doctor in the room also. He had watched the doctor from his view screen and had taken to liking her. She was nervous of that he was sure but she had managed to keep her composure the entire time that she had been there. She had been alone now for hours and had made it a point of smiling down at them and keeping her distance. Once again the crew felt the shaking and thunder that always accompanied the beings whenever they came in or came close to their ship. At first it had caused quite a stir and people had been caught off guard therefore falling into each other. But, this time they had been prepared. They had seen the woman being turn her our head and they knew that someone might be walking in. Everyone on the bridge braced for contact and watched as the seven strange huge creatures entered into the room. Each one of them had something in their hand. They appeared to be speaking into it and waiting for an answer. Or turned to his communication officer, but she shook her head there was no sound coming through her set. For a moment or thought that there was some kind of technical difficulty, but within moments the voice came through on his communications console. It was going to be a long tedious conversation between all the beings, but he had to save his people and this was his best bet. 
The translator held his device and began to speak to the beings that were now in the very same lab as he was. He found this both frightening and intriguing. This was a chance of a lifetime for him and there was a good chance that he might never leave the lab again. For it had been agreed that if anyone entered the lab no one would leave until some kind of solution was reached. Allowing the alien beings or the people that had been exposed to them directly was not an option. The danger that they would impose on the people of Earth was too great. With a deep breath the negotiations began. Chapter 12, Chapter 12 Certainly the people from the United Nation and or would have preferred to negotiate face to face. Trying to speak to someone through a robotic translator with no facial expressions was like trying to make butter with no cream. The ship where the leader of the crew a man named or had a window of sort in the front of it, but even with a microscope no one in the room was able to see the beings in the ship. Or was watching in fascination as the beings walked cautiously around the room and approached the microscope that they were still sitting unmoving under. They were trapped as or could clearly see that with the swipe of one of the beings hands his whole crew would be destroyed. They were willing to speak to him and his crew. His motto had always been to seek out new lives. Well, here they were and he would be the first to speak to them directly. He felt honored at the prospect. Patiently he watched as the beings spoke to each other and then the communication opened. The professor started to translate once again and this was his chance. This chance comes once in a person's lifetime if ever at all. We are the people of a planet that we call Earth. Our planet is in immediate danger as we speak. A disease that has been traced back to the station that we have in the sky has consumed millions of our people. Or listened to the message and took a deep breath. Everyone on the bridge was looking around in shock. They had not left the ship for days. Or had been the only one of the crew along with his second mate to leave the ship or knew that he had not come in contact with any of these beings. But, then he remembered the strange smaller animal that he had gotten caught up in. He had scratched him. Was that what might have started the horrors that both his people and the people of the planet Earth were now enduring? He wondered. It was then that Or spoke up. I am Or the captain of this ship. We are from the planet M. We are a peaceful people and have been searching the universe for other intelligent beings. We were on our way to an asteroid just a few miles from your building in the sky when we became trapped in your gravity zone. We could not escape and sent one of our best crew members to speak to you. But, because of your size you could not see or hear her and to our horror we saw her and her ship full of crew enter the body of one of the beings in the building. We watched as our crew members tried to escape but they were not successful and the entire crew had died. It was not until later that we realized that the person that had ingested our crew members had died also. With that or waited for a response. The response time was slow as each word that was going to be said to each other carefully. Diplomacy was a slow process. It would take much patience. As the professor with the use of his translator spoke to the representatives of the United Nations an unease was felt throughout the room. This was something that could lead the people of Earth to blame the people on board the space station. This could not work and they needed to start covering the politicians. Sometimes when several countries come in contact with each other their personal interests tend to get in the way of what is right. This was the planet and all of the inhabitants of the planet. If they could not get together and work with or the planet was doomed. Finally the members agreed on a communication and the professor began translating their words for or and the other beings to hear. Was a slow process as the mathematical equations that he was using were very complex. So he said to the beings in the spacecraft, we understand that you arrived on our planet by accident. You are very tiny and it is quite possible that we would not have even known of your arrival had it not been for this deadly disease. Not only has the disease spread quickly it has spread over our entire planet. We need to have the actions of your other crews stop these deadly attacks immediately. Once more or listened to the words of the large beings who were now just a few feet from him and his men. They were very capable of killing them and yet they had made no aggressive move towards them. They were willing to speak to him and were now waiting for an answer. But, the question was how did a scratch cause such a deadly disease to such a large race of people? Other than that one contact here on Earth he and his crew had had no other contact. After thinking about it for a minute he answered the people who were now waiting for his answer. He began to speak to the beings from in the, the planet Earth once again, 
we are but one ship and ever since we were hurled to your planet we have not left the tree where the small being had lived. My men have not been outside of our ship since our arrival. Myself and my science officer did leave in our small shuttle. The only contact that we have had on Earth with any beings was with the animal that lived in the tree where we had taken refuge. With that the message was sent and once more or and his crew would have to wait for an answer. As the professor continued with the translation it became apparent that there might have been another ship that had landed on the Earth. Was that a possibility? They knew what animal the aliens were speaking about. It had to be the squirrel that had been in the tree where they were hiding. Somehow perhaps as Orr and his science officer had left the confines of the tree they might have bumped into or scratched the squirrel. If he and his ship had stayed within the confines of the small community then there had to be another ship. Orr had been sitting in his chair awaiting another communication when his worst fears were verified. As he listened to the message he realized that when he had gotten tangled in the being's fur he must have accidentally scratched the animal. At that time he had no idea that the scratch would be the beginning of the end for a whole race of people. It had been an accident and he now owed these people his time and knowledge to help them survive their contact. Or's contact with the squirrel could explain the beings of Earth getting sick in the area, but to infect an entire world in such a short time. Someone must have escaped along with his ship from the building in the sky. But, his men weren't aggressive and then he thought of H.O. Ho had been close to his ships when they had been dragged into the gravity of the building perhaps he had been in the area when his ship had been shot down to Earth. But, before he confirmed this with the beings or Earth he would have to thoroughly check all the information that he had on what exactly had happened when they had been thrown back to Earth. Most of the equipment on board the ship had been damaged and up until this time the priority had been to keep life support going and the repair of the thrusters. With this information in mind or sent a brief message to the people of Earth. We have been busy trying to repair our thrusters so we and any other ships that were stranded. That way we could escape the dangers that your planet holds for my people, we keep a complete recording of everything that happens on board our ship. We will review our programs and get back to you as soon as we have an answer. As the professor read the message to the diplomats in the room they all took a seat. They knew that this could take hours. The information was so important though they would wait. Chapter 13 Ho was in all of his glory. He had managed to get his ship onto another vehicle that the beings of this planet used to go long distances. The vehicle flew through the air at a great speed and would land at a large building with many other beings. Once Ho and his crew landed they would be able to spread the sickness that was killing the beings on the planet, they would wait patiently as the ship was traveling and they were safe. To infect the beings on the vehicle could be dangerous for them so for now the beings on the plane were safe. On Earth the population was in panic mode. No one but absolutely essential personnel were allowed to even step outside of their home. The military were everywhere and had been instructed to shoot anyone that they saw outside even if it was just on their porch. The military had taken over control of the entire world and there was no mercy. Doctors and nurses were now at the hospitals 24 hours a day without any chance to leave. They were eating sleeping and living in care centers in every town. Everyone was on strict quarantine and the only way to leave their homes was to contact a number that no one answered. The television stations were broadcasting information 24 hours a day and the news had been terrible. People were dying within just three hours of being infected. While they were infected it was rumored that some had turned to cannibalism. There had been reports of children eating their parents and parents eating their children. No this was not a case of eating brains these people were eating the entire body. When someone came upon the people who were infected they were in extreme danger. The person would become very aggressive and attack anyone that came near them once the first hour of their sickness had passed. It was necessary that once a person had a scratchy throat that they be tied down immediately. If not no one in the home was safe and everyone would be dead by the end of the day. Death was not a pretty picture for most of the victims either. In most cases the last few minutes would find the patient in immense pain with blood coming out of every major and minor organ in the body. The people would bleed from their eyes ears nose and mouth profusely shortly before death. 
Do not touch any of the blood people were warned over and over. So most people wrapped their victims up before they were dead or too sick and upon passing would throw the covers over the complete body. This had worked in a few places, but unfortunately not many. Time after time entire families were wiped out within hours. The television and radio reported the information every single minute. There was no way to pull away from the news unless you shut everything off. It was scaring everyone and especially the children. Up until the third day you could go to internet sites and watch old shows, but today the government had shut those down. They wanted everyone on earth to know what was going on in every household and in their own country. The people were isolated sick and frightened. This never makes for a good mix and even the governments knew that the people would rebel. Or was now busy examining each and every video that his ship had. There were hundreds of cameras and he knew that he was facing the prospect of possibly having to examine each and every one of them. But, he thought that the best camera for him to examine first would be the camera that was installed at the viewfinder. That camera had a wide 360 degree angle and watched the outside of the ship. If anything went by the outside of the ship they would see it. As the film was wound back to the beginning just one half hour before he was dragged down to the planet Earth or and his crew began looking at other cameras on the bridge at the same time. The camera showed the horror as the ship was hurled into space at an excessive speed and how it rolled and rolled in a downward spiral from the gravity of the planet down below that he now knew was known by the name of Earth. As the ship rolled in the corner, yes there it was. There was a ship being hurled itself down towards the planet. He enhanced the picture and froze it in place. It was Ho's ship. Ho had come to Earth that awful day too. Now Or and his men knew the truth. They had been followed by their enemy onto the building that orbited the planet Earth. When the being had died and the other beings had sent his body into space Ho had been sent down there also. It was true that because of an accident or had infected that small animal, but Ho was the one that was causing so many deaths of the beings on this planet. He owed the people of this planet a safe return to a normal life. Unfortunately, the two beings would have to make some kind of peace with the beings of Earth correct the damage that they had done to the best of their ability and then move to another planet. These beings were too large and dangerous for his people and they were too small and dangerous for the beings of Earth. They would have to know each other from a distance to keep everyone safe. But, what could he do? He sent the message to the beings in the room and watched their faces. As the people in the lab heard the news from the translator. They looked at each other and now was the time that they had come to the lab to do. It was time for a decision to be made on how to handle the situation. There were drastic thought being considered at the United Nations as they spoke. The people of Earth were in a real panic and it now estimated that 10% of the people from the planet had died or were in the process of dying at this very moment. There had been a discussion of nuking certain parts of the planet allowing certain areas to just die starving the disease, none of the suggestions had been very pretty and were considered last-ditch efforts if there was solution found soon. General Blake was back at the center waiting for the relay from the lab when he heard the news. There was another entity they had not caught the bad being. The bad being was now free and thought to be someplace near Hawaii. Perhaps the men on the ship with or would know of a way to hurt or kill this man named Ho and his dangerous adversaries. His medical team had discovered something on the space station. The beings that had attacked the space station originally were very sensitive to certain sounds that didn't bother the crew of the space shuttle or any other being on their planet. Was this an avenue that should be pursued he thought? Yes. He would have the technicians keep working on that train of thought. Chapter 14, Chapter 14 It was now time for Orr and his crew to accept what had happened. Although, the members of their crew had nothing to do with what was happening to the creatures that inhabited the world directly, they had contributed to the invasion. A man that they had known as very dangerous had invaded the planet and was killing its inhabitants. Or was aware of many ways to destroy all of the members of their world. That was not a good idea and would be the last thought on his mind, but he couldn't allow himself to be responsible for the deaths of millions of beings whose planet was dying because of the action of beings such as he. As Orr made the walk down the hallway to speak to his medical doctor his mind raced. His planet had been a violent place where countries and even families fought many wars. After many years of wars and endless unhappiness most of the people on the planet had made peace with each other. 
Ho was the leader of a group of people that believed that they had been left out of the peace and harmony that most of they people had found. Ho had been a trusted member of the country of which or belonged. Or and Ho had been friends fiat one time. But, due to bitterness and Ho's blind thoughts of how he and his people had been ignored in the reorganization of their planet. This had not been true as everyone had gotten together for the first time in centuries. But, Ho had been determined to rule the planet the way that he wished and had accumulated a large group of followers. After a major trial in which Ho had been sentenced to death he had escaped. Many of the people from his planet were sympathizers of his plight and had aided him in his escape. It had been over ten years since he had seen or heard from the man. Or's planet had flourished during those years. Space travel had been explored several years before and the people had encouraged Orr and his crew to go out into space. There would be a group of twenty ships and their mission would be to seek out new lives and attempt to make contact with other planets. No matter what their mission was to be a peaceful one and under no circumstances were he and his crew to engage in anything violent. They had traveled for months and had not had any success. They had come upon many planets, but had found no life. It was not until they came upon the building above the planet that anything strange had happened. It had been on the space building itself that his sensors had picked up another life form or should have immediately checked it out, but he had been busy with the deaths of the other crews or had failed in his mission. As far as he knew at this very moment he and Ho might be the only members of their planet alive. He had left the building in the sky. That would be his first question to the beings of Earth. M.O. was the ship's doctor. He had been trying to care for the crew members who had been made sick by the strange rain that had covered the ship when the beings on the building in the sky had sprayed it. The rain was causing breathing and digestive problems with all on board, but some had been closer to the sides of the ship and had gotten exposed to a stronger dose of this strange rain. He had already lost two crew members there were two more that were very ill. They were fighting the sickness but their condition had still not improved no matter what he did. Or walked into the doctor's office and took a seat. He considered M.O. to be a friend and he wanted to discuss what options were available. M.O. took a seat across from his friend and waited to hear what his friend and commander had to say. M.O. as you probably know by now, Ho was with us in the space building. He has caused the death of millions of beings on this planet. If we don't help them stop Ho and his men from taking over the planet our planet will be responsible for the death of a planet that made no action against us. We will be guilty of the murder of billions of beings. Perhaps we should never have left our planet. The thought of space travel had always bothered M.O. He had supported his friend and had been understandably curious about just what was out there in the vast vacuum that was known as outer space. But, now they were here on a place that the inhabitants called Earth and if he could he was going to help the people even if it costs him his own life. I am sorry I was just lost in thought. What we need to do is find some kind of deadly force that will kill our people, but not hurt the beings on the planet. I have been thinking of what we have used when we execute one of our prisoners. It is quick and efficient, but unfortunately, I would have no way of getting such a sound around this large planet. And would it be deadly to the beings that are living there? We must contact the beings of Earth again he said. Yes, of course he was right. They would need to give the decibel level to the beings and see if they could use them to stop Ho and his men. Hopefully, they could come up with some kind of protection for Or and his men, but if not they will give their lives in honor. There had been no word for over an hour and General Blake was getting nervous. What was going on in that small ship with the commander named Or yes, they could eliminate that ship quickly, but they were the Earth's best hope of discovering a cure for the disease that was threatening to destroy all of the animals in the world. That is when he got the message once more from the lab. As General Blake listened to the translated recording he found this information very interesting. He immediately contacted the people at the Center for Disease Control. He gave the message word for word and they promised that they would get right back to him with the information. Dr. Grant at the Center for Disease Control looked at the information. Yes, it was true certain sounds had been known to cause severe illness and death when given in a certain environment. The decibel that had been given wasn't even within the range of the human ear. There were some animals such as dogs that would hear it but humans would not. This sound could be applied with no danger to anyone living on their planet Earth. There was much to be planned now. How could they place the sound around the world? What would work? 
What could they use? How could they kill the bad men that were Ho's allies and not harm their new friends and crew members who were with Orr? This had to be done quickly, but how would they send the sound to the entire world? Chapter 15, Chapter 15 The solution to protecting Orr and his crew was an easy fix. The ship could be moved albeit very carefully, to a soundproof room this would work as there was such a room just a few feet from the lab been damaged as a result of them moving it. The ship and crew had been left on the microscope and had not been moved since it had been discovered that there were intelligent beings living there and that moving them could cause them great harm. For the first time in its history the people of Earth were doing the humanly thing. They would move both the microscope and the ship at the same time. It was now for General Blake to give the message to his translator. It would need to be understood as the crew and or could be in danger if directions weren't followed correctly. This would be a dangerous mission as the professor was not positive that all messages had been received in complete form and understood completely. Ho had found himself on a long trip across a vast water. The flight had already taken three hours and he was beginning to get nervous. He was sure that the beings on the flight had no idea that he and his men were there but soon they would need to eat and his men were looking at a large group of delicious beings very close by. They would have to survive on their own supplies until they arrived on land once again. He assured his men that they would feast like kings when they finally landed. For the time his men were satisfied. On the space station there was a soundproof room also that would work in keeping horse men and crew that were still there safe. General Blake was to make contact with the space station personally this time. With the aid of a translator he spoke to both the people who were members of Orr's team and members of his own team. This is what I want you to do he instructed the surviving members of the space station. I want you to take all of the spaceships and place them in the soundproof room. Make sure the door is shut tight and then once you acknowledge that the room is secure there will be a sound sent to the station. This station will kill any other beings that might be in your area. Make sure that only your ships enter the soundproof room. Is this message clear and understood? He asked. We understand was the quick answer to the question from the people at the space station. To say the last few hours had been tense there would be an understatement. The ships had stayed on one end of the room while the people had stayed at the other end. The next step was how to help the aliens leave their environment safely. But, first they had to destroy any of the bad aliens who had unlawfully entered their space. Mi had been hiding behind a strange structure watching what had been going on. She had been able to listen to the transmissions and now knew of the danger that she and her people faced. She and her crew needed to get into that room without anyone seeing her. But, how was she to do that? They would be watching for her carefully. Everyone on her ship was hungry and tired as so was she. Had heard the message and knew that her crew was now in danger. She had been hidden from view by going behind this large screen but now she would have to take her chances so they say. As the crew on the station began their travel towards the room that the beings were directing them to they discovered the other ship. It was the ship that belonged to one of their enemies me and she was attempting to obtain access into the room with them. Phasers locked and each of the ships attacked the ship of me on board the space station the people could not tell that there was a battle going on. But, it was me was good and giving up the good fight. With all phasers and bombs going she managed to damage two of the ships severely. Somehow, though every one of the remaining aliens arrived in the room without any unknowns. Through the translator they informed the beings on the ship that they were now safe and sound in the soundless room. Me and her ship were badly damaged and as she attempted to gain control of her ship and body she watched the doors to the room closed. Not long after she heard the sound that
is all rubbish. But, as the plane landed the people on the airplane could see that there was a military bus approaching them. Out of the vehicle stepped several armed men. They were not getting off. Ho had been aware of the noise and movement on the vehicle that he and his men had been on and was looking around when he heard the sound. The sound was deafening, it was the sound that he had heard before. As he looked around the bridge he watched his men die right in front of him. But, no he had known of the way of execution on his planet and he had worked very hard at becoming immune to it. He was suffering terrible pain but he managed to somehow drive his ship through the small hole in the side of the space vehicle and gotten back to land. Alone and in immense pain Ho aimed his ship towards the city that he could see in the distance. But, now the sound was everywhere. He couldn't think he couldn't breathe. Was it in his mind or was it really all around him? He was now alone and dying. At least, he thought to himself. The crew that Orr had so proudly commanded were now dead also. As he breathed his last breath he felt at peace. Hour after hour the sound was sent out everywhere. But, the best news was that some of the less sick were beginning to show signs of improvement. As a matter of fact, one of the patients in the hospital where Dr. Gordon had seen so many deaths had woken up and asked for a glass of water. Time would tell when it came to many of the patients who were much more ill. Then of course, there was the worry about what kind of damage had been done to some people that would take years to show up. But, people were getting better and there had now been no new reports of illnesses in the world for over an hour. What they were doing was working. The members of the team that had been in the lab with the aliens were keeping a sharp eye on what was happening in the world. Each one of them represented a different country and they were very worried about what was happening in their own country. But hour after hour no new reports came through and people were getting better. Unfortunately, the deaths were still coming, but they were getting less and less frequent and people were starting to breathe a breath of relief. As for all the aliens who were waiting in their soundproof rooms they had no way to contact the outside. Their communications were now dead and they were just going to have to sit and wait. They were told that they could be in that room for up to a week. They had food and shelter, and they were safe or assured them that everything was going to be all right it was just a matter of time. General Blake had been on the direct line to the president's office and had been pleased to be able to relay the good news. Now what to do with all of these aliens? Could they be trusted? They could kill everyone on the planet for God's sakes. He was a military man and wanted them all exterminated. After all, the Earth was no longer in danger as long as these aliens were kept in soundproof rooms perhaps they should be left there until a vaccine was found at least. Then there was the problem of the space station. If they were to allow the aliens the freedom to leave how could they? The gravity center that held the station in place was stopping them from leaving. Perhaps the people on board the station could use the small shuttle that they had and take the beings into outer space or at least far enough so that they could escape the gravity that was holding them hostage. After much thought General Blake had come up with a possible solution that would work with everyone concerned. He would send the shuttle up to the space station and on board the shuttle he would place Orr and his ship and crew. Orr heard a tremendous noise and realized that the doors to the room were opening. He saw the beings that had become his neighbors of sorts motioning him and his men to go back into the lab. Here he would be given the best news he could have dreamed of. Through the translator General Blake said, we thank you for your honesty and courage in this terrible situation that you your crew and the people of Earth had found ourselves in. Because of your information on the sounds that could kill your people my people are safe. We salute and thank you. We will now bring you and your ship to a great vessel that we own. We will take you and your crew to the space station. When you arrive there you can gain entry into one of your own ships. Because there are only six people left on the space station they can then go into the shuttle. While in there we can temporarily shut down the life support systems and you can leave in peace. Or and his crew listened to the translator and smiled. Or knew that the ride was going to be a rough one at the very least so he had each and every one of them tie down anything that wasn't secure and prepared themselves for the long ride ahead. Chapter 17, Chapter 17 To say the ride for Or and his men was rough would have been like comparing a trip up the hill to climbing the highest mountain. The beings had taken great precautions to make sure that Orr and his crew were safe, but the roads were rough and with no engines to keep the ship stable everyone on board had been tossed around miserably. 
The aliens were no longer under the microscope and so they were in danger at all times from the gigantic beings that inhabited the planet. Great caution was made as so no one came any closer to the ship than six feet. Whenever anything needed to be moved they used robotic arms. General Blake breathed a breath of relief when he watched the bundle that was carrying Orr and his men were put on the shuttle. We will make sure that no one from our planet ever visits Earth again. Orr and his crew had not been prepared for the loud noise that the ship that they had been put on was going to make. They had filters that were made specifically to protect them from bright lights and loud noises, but this was much louder than anyone had expected. As the noise got louder and louder or thought that his eardrum would burst, but finally they felt the ship that they were on move. It felt as though it was moving very slowly upwards, but they were on their way. General Blake had hoped that he had made the right decision allowing these unknown aliens to leave the planet. But, the decision had come from the White House and he had obeyed the orders. He picked up the translator and once more made contact with the alien named Orr, We the people of Earth wish to thank you for your selfless courage and honesty during such an emergency here on my planet Earth. It is our wish that once you leave our planet and are safe from our gravity you contact your planet and tell backslash L your leaders that it is the wish of the people of the planet of Earth keep in verbal contact with you and your people. Because of the dangers that both us and you pose to each other we feel that any one-on-one -on -one contact is not a possibility at this time. We wish you and your people peace and harmony. Thank you once again. And with that General Blake waited for their response. Or had a hard time hearing what was being said. The ship was so loud and things had been thrown around so. But, he understood that the beings of Earth wanted to keep in touch with him and they wished to establish contact with his leaders on the planet. It would be his and theirs first contact that would continue and so he responded, Thank you for your kindness and understanding during this difficult time. My crew and I wish to thank the people of Earth and once again apologize for what we did to you. We had no bad intentions and I will be in contact with my people as soon as possible and have them contact you. There are things that we can mutually work on together I am sure. With that or waited for the arrival to the place they called the space station. At the space station the members of the crew remained in the spots that they had been at for the past days. They did not want to harm any of the beings anymore. They knew that although very small they were intelligent and good people. They were people just as the humans were. They just were very small. They had a right to live just as much as any human did. The ride to the space station was a three-day journey and all everybody could do. The television and radio stations covered the whole story. There were going to be books movies and stories told for generations to come. With a death toll of over one billion people they were now safe. Everyone was now going to have to pick up their lives and go on as one always did in times like these. As the space shuttle finally docked or and his crew heard the doors open and close. There were a couple of other strange noises but soon they found themselves back inside the space station where their adventure had started. As Orr made contact with the other crews he was glad to hear that everyone was all right. There had been no other injuries or deaths aboard his ships or the people's space station. He was now ready to enter his second-in-command's ship. The people on the space station were now boarding the shuttle that had taken Orr and his crew to the space station. As he went over to the communication board on his new ship he listened intently through it. He wanted to be ready when they were so that they could make their escape. The more time they took the more danger the beings on the space shuttle would endure. Moments went by when once again he heard the loud noise of the shuttle. Orr knew that it was being prepared for liftoff. He checked all his systems as did every other crew and waited for word from the shuttle. It had not been long before they heard. Then he got the message shuttle is out of range and safe. We are to the south of the station. Please head due north until you are safely are of any harm. Or signaled that he and his group of ships would be ready to go in one minute. As each of them poised at the escape hatch, they remembered the members of their crew who had died. Thought about Ho and how he had once been a hero. Now he and his crew were dead. They were safe and with a bang the group of ships were off to space again. Everyone on Earth watched as the space doors had opened once again and listened to the goodbyes of the beings who had helped save their world. They were good people and heroes to most of them. Everyone sat back and realized just how close they had come to becoming extinct. General Blake was back to work and this time he was enhancing the safety features of the space station and all other space-traveling vehicles. 
or contacted his headquarters and explained everything. Headquarters had been deeply concerned as they had lost contact with Orr and his ships for over two weeks. Now they could relax they had found another world and they wanted to be their friends.